Have you ever had times in your life when you felt absolutely powerless? Of course, all of us have. Uh, Sarah and I, we've only been married for, man, I can't even remember. It's going to be 12 years this year. Um, in the first couple years of our marriage, we experienced several times of powerlessness. Uh, God called us different places, different things, and there are many times when we found ourselves absolutely at the will of God, um, completely stranded of our own will. Example, um, when uh, I moved to Illinois in 2007-ish to go to seminary, um, sometime after that, Sarah became pregnant. I was working construction, and some things happen in the construction industry, like winter up north, you know, up here. You can't do things when the ground is frozen. Uh, work begins to slow off, and so boss came to me one day and said, Joe? Now, when I was little, we learned this song, hey, uh, there was a guy named Joe, he worked in the button factory. One day, his boss came to him and said, Joe, are you busy? I said, no, and that's not what I'm talking about here. It just came into my mind, sorry. <laughs> he said, Joe... We're going out to eat today this afternoon for lunch. Uh, you probably don't want to go with us today. You know, okay, that's kind of weird. Come to find out, he was passive aggressively telling me that I was fired. I don't want to go to lunch today because that would just take out what very little money we have because I am going to be laid off. Because it's winter time and we don't have enough work for you. We might hire you back later. And that never happens. So Sarah's pregnant and I am jobless. And this is October, November time frame, so uh, I can't do the math. But she was at least halfway through her pregnancy or somewhere thereabouts. Scary time, absolutely powerless. You know, talk about being a father trying to provide for your pregnant wife. This is incredibly difficult. And it's happened other times when we have found ourselves jobless, and ha or me being jobless, having to support our kids. And in those moments, you just feel absolutely powerless. It's like there is nothing that you can do in all the world. You could send out thousands of applications. You can call people all day, and still nothing happens, and you feel absolutely powerless. And I'm sure some of you have found yourselves in a very similar uh, situation. We feel powerless. Maybe we look at the world and we see there's all these problems. There's drug addiction. There's human trafficking. There's corrupt politicians and controlling governments and things that we just, they're so messed up. There's corruption and, and sin that is being so abundant and we just want to do something about it. We want to fix the problems. We want to fix the brokenness. We want to heal uh, the pain. We want to eradicate poverty or illness or whatever and we just cannot do it. We are incapable of fixing the problem. Or maybe uh, we, we have natural disasters like hurricanes and tornadoes and, and winter storms that bring ice in inches and feet of snow or a creek that rises, you know, and you, you'll come across uh, the road and the, it's flooded and you can't do anything about it. You're powerless to get to your destination or sometimes it is so bad that it raises too high and people's houses and lives get taken. And we've seen that in our history here. There is nothing that we can do in the face of natural disaster. Earthquakes come, volcanoes erupt, seas and rivers and creeks rise, and we are absolutely powerless to do anything about it. Even when we get the Army Corps of Engineers to come and make a, an engineering solution to this problem, we can never really fix it. It always comes and overpowers us. So we see it. We see that we are so powerless. And if we could do anything, if we could take out an insurance policy, if we could come up with some magic business plan to make it so that these unexpected things do not come and make us completely powerless, we would invest into it. We would buy into it. We would, we would get that product to make us completely 100% secure and safe. Ensure that we are power, we have power over our situations. But that doesn't exist. We are completely powerless as humans. We are at the whim of other people. We are at the whim of natural forces. We are at the whim of an almighty God. So we would not choose to be powerless, most of us. But what would happen if we did make a choice to be powerless? We did choose to reject whatever power we had to follow Jesus where we choose, or because of our choice to follow Jesus, that we put ourselves in vulnerable situations and, and put ourselves in a way that we do not have power over our own lives. What would we do? 
Maybe we get fired for telling our coworker about Jesus. Or maybe you work somewhere and the boss or, or the, the management is corrupt and there's, there's stealing and there's embezzling. Or maybe they're doing things that are illegal and they, they say, don't tell anybody or else you get fired. And you just have a, had enough of it and you cannot participate with these people. So you say, you know what, I'm done with this job. I'm tired of these uh, illegal, immoral people running this business. And so you leave. Because of your faith, you choose to be without a job. Or maybe because you follow Jesus, you have made the choice to follow him, that your friends and family, maybe people that you trusted and loved, they turn their back on you and don't want to have anything to do with you. Because you have chosen to follow Jesus. You become powerless. So what do you do about those situations? What, what can you do when, when you feel depressed or, or, or rejected or sad or alone? In these situations. Well, today we're going to be looking at a, a, a letter that Jesus was writing to the church in Philadelphia. This church found themselves in this very situation that we're talking about. They were powerless because of their choice to follow Jesus. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to begin at verse 7. This is, or, yeah, verse, um, wrong book. <laughs> We're not in 1 Peter. We're in Revelation chapter 3. We're in our series about revive. Jesus is writing these letters to seven churches in, in Asia Minor to help encourage their faith, to, to revive their faith when they were discouraged, to revive their love for other people when they were getting selfish and inward focused, to revive their hope in the, in the midst of their hopelessness. And today he's writing to the church in Philadelphia in their powerlessness. And so hopefully as we read their words that maybe Jesus has something to say in our powerless situations, especially those where we choose to be powerless because of Jesus. Jesus says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens. Now, again, like all the other le uh, letters that Jesus write, writes, he is... Um, tying in to things that he said, or John, the way that John described him in chapter 1. And in chapter 1, uh, John describes Jesus, or Jesus t talks about himself, as having the keys of death and Hades. And so John, or Jesus is connecting that description back here now. Now, the, the, he's drawing on the idea of having a key, or having keys. Keys, we understand that they mean access, responsibility, and authority. If you see somebody with keys to something, you know that they have access, which, um, how many people have a church key? I mean, probably a bunch of y'all have a church key. You guys are special. You have authority over the doors, right? Uh, but if you see somebody having keys, especially like uh, uh, those of you who work at a school, you have people who have a big roll of keys maybe that they can get into all kinds of doors. And there's maybe one key that gets into the principal's office, and that's the most special key. And keys symbolize, in a lot of ways, authority. And in those days, you didn't have these tiny little keys. I mean, we are so lucky to be able to, be able to fit our big bunch of keys in our pockets. Back then... They had huge locks on their door because they didn't have the technology to make small locks. So they had keys that they would carry around. I mean, you would see somebody with, with keys. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but, you know, bigger keys to fit in the bigger locks. And so it was obvious that you see somebody carrying keys. You know that they have been given authority, that, that somebody finds them trustworthy in whatever job that they have. And so as Jesus is saying that he has the key of David, we see that he is trustworthy, that he has been given authority, he has been given power by God. And in chapter 1, we see that Jesus has been given the keys of death in Hades, that he has authority over death. And we see that in him conquering death by coming back to life. And he has the keys of Hades. In other words, he has the key, the authority to distinguish who goes to eternal condemnation and who gets a eternal reward, eternal reward with God in heaven. So Jesus has the authority of our eternal fate, which is sealed with our faith and obedience to Jesus. But in this case, he is, he, is, he is said to have the key of David. And this goes back to an Old Testament story where uh, the guy who was entrusted with the, with the kingdom by the king, the steward of the kingdom, he had the keys of the palace. I mean, literally had the keys of the palace and the kingdom. He was, had great authority. 
He was doing a very bad job, was a corrupt fellow. And so God says in Isaiah uh, chapter 22, you're going to get rid of him and you're going to put somebody else in his position. And so the, the keys pass on to this new guy. He has been given authority in the kingdom of David. And this is being applied to Jesus. That the kingdom has been taken away from somebody else and Jesus has been given the authority over the kingdom. In other words, Jesus has been, uh, the, the authority over the kingdom of God has been taken away from, say, the Jews and their earthly leaders and given to the eternal king who's going to forever sit on the throne of David, the throne of, of God's kingdom. So in, in, a, in, a, in an earthly sense, the kingdom has been taken away from the Jews. We're going to get into this in a couple minutes. And has been given to Jesus. He has authority over God's kingdom. And so we see that God has given his great authority to Jesus. And Jesus says, when I have my key, I open doors and no one can shut and lock that door. There is no one who can close what I open. And if I close the door, there's nothing that anybody can do to open that door. If I prohibit somebody from going somewhere or doing something like he did with the Apostle Paul, the, the Spirit prevented him from going different places, that there's nothing that you can do to change that circumstance. I mean, nothing is going gonna, is gonna to change what God has closed off. And that applies in morality and ethics and all that too. God says this stuff is off limits. We cannot change the fact that it is off limits. We might participate in it. We might say that this stuff is good and acceptable, but it's not. God, we cannot change what God says is right and wrong. So Jesus has authority over that stuff too. And so what we see about this, Jesus having the keys of the kingdom of David, the, king, the keys of death in Hades, is that and he can open and close these doors and nobody can touch them, is that nothing can stand in Jesus' way. When he exercises his authority, nothing can stand in his way. Now, let me, let me draw a picture of this. Uh, when snow drops on the road, we have these trucks that, that strap on these big metal things on the front called a plow, okay? And, I, and don't feel stupid. I'm educating you guys about something you've lived with for your whole lives, okay? You plow, you strap on this thing in this truck called a plow, and when the, when the plow goes, it, there's nothing, I mean, it just pushes the snow. The snow does not stop the truck. And, and that is phenomenal. Um, well, I saw a video the other day of this train, I think it was in Canada, that had this plow on it, and the snow, I mean, was you know, halfway up the, the front of the, the train engine. And big pile, I mean, just think about the weight, tons of snow, literally in its way. And just, the train was just going on, like a knife, the warm knife through butter, just nothing was in its way. It was pushing with its plow, and all the, these tons of snow for miles and miles could not get in its way, could not stop the train. Because it had, this, it had the, the, right, the right tool for the job, if you will. It had, it had the power to push through the snow like the trucks do on our roads. And that is what it is. That is the picture of Jesus. That when he is doing his will, there is nothing that can get in his way to stop it. Now, we might try to pass legislation. We might try to uh, orient our lives in such a way that God is not going to boss us around. Or maybe when people stand in his way to try to stop Christianity, that they are not going to win because Jesus in his power is going to keep barreling through no matter how many obstacles we put in the way. So people are going to try to stop God's people. People are going to claim to have some great power, whether it's because of their political clout or it's because of their bank accounts or maybe because they are a CEO of a great corporation or maybe it is because they belong to a particular party or not. They will claim to have great power and they're going to try to do things to violate God's will and plan. And some people are going to come along and say that, hey, I know better than Jesus. I've got some new truth or some new philosophy. And, and what we read about Jesus, that's just a bunch of garbage, it's a myth, it's, you know, whatever. It's not true. So people are going to come along and think they know better than God. But if they are not following Jesus, they are going to be stopped. The, the, whatever they're trying to do is not going to last. They're not going to be able to plow Jesus down. Jesus is going to come and keep moving forward with his will and his plan for our lives and in this world. So Jesus has been given this great authority. I mean, he begins this, this passage with, I have the keys, I have the authority. So let's see how that plays into the situation. In verse 8, he says, I know your works. 
Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now we've seen in other letters where Jesus says, I know your works. And most of those times, it is a good thing. And he knows their works. He knows their hard work, their dedication. That is awesome. Last week we found the exception to that. Um, but in this situation, it is again God commending them, celebrating their good works and, and their endurance here um, that he's talking about, that they have not given in to the pressures. They have not denied his name. Even when the Roman culture, even when the Jews are telling them to deny Jesus, they are not denying. They are holding fast to their faith. But as he is talking about their works, he, he said, in the midst of talking about their works, he throws in this statement. That I have set a door in your midst that no one is able to shut. I have opened up this door that nobody can shut. Even though they're trying, even though they want to shut the door, they cannot shut it because I, the one who has all the power over everything, I have opened this door so nobody can shut it. But in the midst of that, he, he is talking about them having little power. That because of the, the situation in their culture, their, their context, that they had very little power. And I'll show how this, this is all connecting here in a second. The reason why they had very little power is because uh, they were being excluded from Jewish society. He's going to talk about the synagogue of Satan here in a second. That they have been excluded from the Jewish synagogue, excluded from Jewish society. And so that means that they no longer get the exception under Roman law to worship idols. Because Jews were given an exception. You don't have to worship our idols or worship Caesar. Christians being no longer a part of the synagogue or the Jewish community no longer get that exception and they are now legally bound to bow down to these idols and worship these gods and participate in their immorality and worship and bow down to Caesar and Rome as gods. And then because they refuse to, they are oppressed and rejected. They are seen as um, breaking the peace, as being renegades, rebels. And also... Um, I've mentioned trade guilds a bunch, um, and that's a big part of the context about what's going on here, is that in order to have a job in a lot of Roman societies, you had to belong to a trade guild, which meant that they participated in worship of idols. All these trade guilds had their own patron deity that they would worship. Christians could not participate in that because of the idol worship. And so they said, no, we cannot participate in a trade guild, so no one would hire them because they did not belong to the guild. Because they would not participate in the immorality that that trade guild was promoting. Can't help but see some parallels in our current society, which I'm not going to get into that political rant. But they, they, they are powerless because they cannot get a job. They are powerless because they cannot bow down to the idols. They are powerless because they are being oppressed and rejected from society. The Romans won't have anything to do with them. The Jews won't have anything to do with them. Their families have nothing to do with them. They're absolutely powerless in the face of all this. But it wasn't just that. There was a general ethos of the city of Philadelphia that they felt, all of them, Jew, Gentile, Christian, all of them felt powerless because the city was prone to earthquakes. Seven, in 17 AD, the whole city was destroyed. It was rebuilt, but it was prone to other earthquakes. And so this, the residents of Philadelphia, they lived outside the city for the most part. Because they were afraid of the earthquakes. They were powerless over nature. And so they lived outside so that they could be safe. Even though they were outside the walls where they were then vulnerable to wolves and lions and robbers and all that stuff. They felt safer outside where it was more dangerous than inside. So they felt powerless as a city over their own environments. They did not feel safe. So all of these things working together, the Christians in Philadelphia were the least Powerful of all the people in all of the city. But despite that lack of power, they were still remaining faithful to Jesus. They were staying connected to the right power. And Jesus had set this door open in the midst of them that nobody could shut. That even though they were powerless, Jesus stepped in with his power. 
to enable them to be powerful, even though that politically, um, religiously, they were completely powerless. Jesus stepped in and did something for them. And he, he's talking about this open door. This is a reference to the fact that he has opened the door to the kingdom of heaven for them. That because of what Jesus did on the cross, they can have eternity with Jesus. So he's opened up the door for salvation. But not only that, but he has opened up an opportunity for them to preach about Jesus. Even though it is illegal, even though it is going to get them uh, kicked out of the synagogue and oppressed by the Jewish, uh, the, the, the members of the Jewish society, that they still have the power, the ability to witness for Jesus. Nothing can take away their ability to talk about Jesus and spread the gospel of peace. Nothing can take away the power that God supplies. And so that tells us that we need the right kind of power. Political power wouldn't have helped them. Um, economic power wouldn't have helped them. None of that power. It is only the power of God that helps. And so we, we need the right kind of power. Now, I have a quick visual demonstration. Um, in, in our electrical system, we have two kinds of power, basic, two basic kinds of power. We have alternating current, direct current. Um, if you plug one thing that's direct current into an alternating current, what's going to happen? Kaboom! Vice versa. If you plug the wrong thing into the wrong kind of power, it is going to explode or just not work. I'll try not to blow up your keyboard. Okay. Visual demonstration. Okay. So we have different kinds of power, and, and this lamp happens to be 120 or 110 volts. If you were to plug this lamp into 220 circuit, that would be fun. And yeah, let me show you. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but if you have the right kind of power, it's just going to work. But if you don't have the right kind of power, if you try and plug it in the wrong uh, thing, it's not going to work. But if you plug it in the right thing, it works. Imagine that. And this is, a, this is a visual demonstration of what it means to connect to the power of Jesus. He has the power. He has the authority, unlimited power and authority available to us. He has opened the door. Nobody can shut it. We have to tap into his power source in order to get that power. And he, and he has given that power through this open door, through what Jesus has done. And the point is, is that we can try to tap into all kinds of different power to solve our solutions. And all of those things, it's like plugging this lamp into 220, it is going to blow it up. If we try to plug ourselves into the wrong kind of power, it is going to completely wreck us spiritually. So we can, let me, let me name some of these power supplies that we try to plug ourselves into. The first one, we talked about it in our Sunday school class, the self-esteem. If you try to get by in life by, you know, trying to increase your self-esteem or self-will yourself through something, you're going to fail because our self-esteem and our self-willpower is fragile. I mean, someone could say something to us and shut us down. Oh, I'm so sad. And then if we are trying to base our lives off our own self-esteem and self-willpower, some discouraging word will shut us down and we'll be unproductive in society. Or if we try to turn to political power, I mean, that can shift as the wind. I mean, political power, power uh, parties come and go, and even there's vaccines things that happen that corrupt elections and all that sort of things. So if we turn to politics, we're just going to get frustrated. If we turn to drugs or alcohol or pharmaceuticals to fix our problems, then we're going to get ourselves even worse. Or maybe we rely on our reputation Hey, if I can just get in with the right people, or I've got to have a good reputation of being a good Christian, maybe people will um, they'll come to my business, or, or maybe they'll, they'll hang out with me, or whatever, you know. We rely on a reputation with other people to get us by, rather than the power of Jesus. Or maybe we just want to have the best and the, and the most awesome stuff. So that people will look, hey man, look at that nice truck that guy's driving. Woo! He must be something. Or look at how nice their house is. You know, we, we try to rely on our physical possessions to make a good impression for people to win their approval. And all of these sources of power and influence will get us nowhere. We have to con be connected to the right source of power through Jesus. So even though they had this small amount of power compared to the world, they had this unlimited power that came through Jesus and they were able to do some really awesome things. Because of that. And uh, Jesus here is going to go on to give them some encouragement. Even though they might feel powerless, like they can't do a whole lot for Jesus, he's going to give them some encouraging words. 
He says, I know your works. Well, I already read that, didn't I? <laughs> Whoops. Fast forward. Behold. I'm like Marco Rubio up here. I don't know if you've paid attention, but he's had a couple speeches lately where he's, he's said a sentence and then literally said the same sentence right over. Okay, I'm not Marco Rubio. <laughs> just, just joking. Um, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, but say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you, because you have kept my word about patient endurance. And I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole earth, on the whole world, to try those who will dwell on the earth. So Jesus is telling them that you are being oppressed, you are being rejected in society, you are, injustice is being done to you because of your faith. Well, there's coming a day when I'm going to come back and I'm going to reverse all of that. Those people who are oppressing you, they're going to come and they're going to bow down and they are going to acknowledge that, yes, I have loved you and I have given them perseverance in this life to overcome the trials that, that they put in front of them. That these people who are oppressing Christians, that they're going to realize that they're wrong and they're going to have to bow down and they're going to have to uh, come to, to terms with their sin and the fact that they have rejected Jesus and his people. And so these people who are claiming to be Jews and are not, they're lying because they have rejected who Jesus is. They do not acknowledge the Messiah and they are, uh, as a result of oppressing his people, they are going to be held accountable for that, for turning on God's real chosen people who follow Jesus. So he's saying that they are going to, all these wrongs being done to them are going to be made right. That he is giving them power to persevere in all of these situations. But it's not just that that is awesome. But he also tells them that when he comes to judge the world, as he is going to come and bring this great tribulation on the world, which is uh, him judging the world, because they have rejected Jesus, they're going to face the consequences of their sin, that those who are faithful to Jesus, who do not give in to the temptation to bow down to these idols or turn from Jesus, that they are going to be spared from the heartache of being separated from God for all of eternity. That they are going to be with Him for all of eternity, so they're going to be spared from the judgment because of the blood of Jesus. Because they have been forgiven, they have been cleansed, they have been set apart for God's holy works, that they will be with Him for eternity. And so we see that wrongs will be made right. That we, when we are mistreated because we are followers of Jesus, there is a day when all of that injustice is going to be fixed and corrected when Jesus comes back. And we also see in, the, in this passage that as we are going through this, that, that, that those um, who are oppressing us, that they're going to see that God loves us one day. And so as we are in the midst of suffering from Jesus or being outcast because of Jesus or we are powerless because of Jesus, we've got to know that, that God loves us, that he is there with us in the midst of it. It's not like he's uh, standing back and saying, oh, I told you that was going to happen. Deal with it. He is there with us to give us hope and courage in the midst of all of what we're going through. So we just need to trust him, knowing that he's going to make all of these wrong things right. Okay, so he's saying that all these wrongs are going, to be, are going to be turned around and good things are coming. Just hold on. And then he goes on to, to say some, some more encouraging words and give them some promises in verse 11 where he says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. He says to you, hold on. I'm coming. Hold on. I'm coming. And I'm not a singer. I will not be doing special music, Carol. Um, <laughs> We all know that, that song, that old song, Hold On, I'm Coming. And that is exactly what Jesus is saying. I am coming. Hold on to what you have. Hold on to your salvation, your hope. Hold on to me. Because I am coming soon. I will deal with this problem in due time. Hold on. Have patience. It, it'll be over soon. And he says, To the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So he says, hold on, I'm coming. Hold on, I'm giving you power, I'm giving you strength, just hold on. It, you know, we've seen those, those posters of the cat, you know, the motivational posters from the 90s, the cat's hanging on the wall, it just says, hang on, whatever. That's what Jesus is saying, hold on. 
Don't give up. Your eternal reward is on the line. Don't let somebody take it from you. No matter how much they are pressuring you to give in and give up Jesus, hold on. There's something even more awesome coming. And he tells them that they are going to be made pillars in the temple of God, which is a significance. That they, once they are made pillars, important supports for the temple, that they are no longer going to have to leave. This is significant for the people in Philadelphia. They are used to having to leave the city for fear of earthquakes and natural disasters. So there is a time coming when they are going to be absolutely secure in the presence of God. And not only are they are going to be in the presence of God, but they are going to have inscribed on them, permanently tattooed, the name of God, the name of Jesus, and the name of the New Jerusalem. So they are going to be identified as God's people, the place where God dwells, that these have been bought with the blood of Jesus. And as Jesus puts us there in the temple of God, nothing can take us away. Because he has authority, he has been given keys, he has been given the, the, the authority to build this temple as he see fits, and as we are faithful to him, he puts us there forever. And so from this, we see that Safety, security and safety are not found in this world. They are found with God in, in heaven for all of eternity. And we see how violent our world is. I mean, if you've ever heard anything about Australia, everything in Australia wants to kill you. The plants, the, the spiders, which are this big and they eat birds, um, the snakes... And we, li I lived, you know, we lived in Florida for, for a while. I grew up there. There are a lot of things in Florida that want to kill you. The hurricanes... Spiders, brown recluses, and uh, black widows, which I know we have up here too. Uh, spiders want to kill you. Um, alligators? We had alligators, you know. We, we didn't think twice about swimming in a pond with an alligator. It was just life. Uh, alligators want to kill you, so there's lots of things. Um, but there are volcanoes, there are earthquakes, there are tsunamis, there are all sorts of things that want to kill us in this world that aren't people. So nature tells us that we are not safe and secure in this world. And we shouldn't feel safe and secure in this world. We get into trouble when we begin to feel safe and secure in this world. We get lazy. We get um, lax in our faith. We do get lax in our mission. So we ought not feel safe. Because it motivates us to do uh, good for the kingdom. So Jesus is saying we don't have security in this life, but we have security in heaven with him for all of eternity. There is coming a day when things come to try to destable us and throw off our equilibrium in this world that we're not going to have that, that we're not going to be thrown off balance by weird things that happen in our lives, that nothing will be able to, dis to destroy us or discourage our faith or discredit us as followers of Jesus, that nature won't try to kill us. Satan will no longer be tempting us. Unbelievers will no longer oppress us. Disease will never strike us. We just have to hold on because Jesus is coming. Patience, endurance through the power of Jesus. So the real true power is found only in Jesus. That the things that we turn to in this world, they are not going to get us through. They are not going to get us to Jesus for eternity. Only the power that has come through Jesus will get us in eternity with God. So there's lots of stuff that Jesus is trying to tell this church in Philadelphia that felt so powerless. There are lots of things that we should apply to our lives in what we have talked about. But there are, I think, two primary things that Jesus wants us to take away. The first one is that true power is found only in Jesus. Not politics, economics, or social clout. Nothing gives us real power except Jesus in his blood. And also we see that when Jesus opens a door for us, nothing is going to stop us. No laws, no pressure, no economic situations, no hard times, no sickness, no death. Nothing will stop us from doing what God calls us to do. From fulfilling our mission, from loving each other, for having a faith in Jesus. Nothing can stop that when Jesus opens that door. So the world wants to use its power to intimidate us. The world wants us to stop talking about Jesus. The world wants us to stop living like Jesus because they feel guilty for their own sin. The world wants to remove our hope of the life to come. But Jesus has placed an open door in front of us. 
He has placed an open door in our church, in our community, in our world that no one can shut. He saved us from our sins on the cross. He has made a way for us to have eternal security with him in heaven. But he has also made a way for us to continue to share our hope with this lost and dying world. That nothing, no matter who objects to us, no matter who throws a fit about us sharing our faith, nothing can stop us from sharing our faith. The world wants us to cower in fear. The world wants to shut off our light. When Jesus, when we are connected to Jesus, when he turns on the light in our lives, no one can shut it off. No one can stamp out our witness for Jesus. So the world wants us to be afraid. He wants us, uh, wants us to shut off our light. But Jesus gives us the power to face that fear with boldness and keep on going no matter what bad circumstances get in our way, no matter what opposition we face. There is still power through Jesus. So let us connect to that power. Let us find that power. And let us walk with Jesus through the doors that he opens in our lives and opens in our community to share our hope so that the lost will see the light come to Jesus.